when we're thinking about land leasing, what we're doing is still looking at that collaborative arrangement. So all the, all the matters related to, to the, uh, the personal relationship is still important. The prescriptions of writing down what might be in the deal, even more important. Um, but in this country, it's a bit like our culture with house ownership. Now, in the financial press, you know, and on the news and so forth, you always hear about the, uh, that, the home owners, the new home owners wanting to buy their own home. And it's an aspirational, it's an aspirational component of our culture. It's also an aspirational component of agriculture, historically. But it's not true in other parts of the world. In the USA, uh, in particular, and in the UK, there are counties in the US where 60% of a county, 60% of the production, livestock, whether it's dairy or beef or grain, 60% of that production comes off leased land. So that's been part of the culture of, of much of, Amer of the USA and also more so in the UK. And it goes back to feudal times when the landlord who lived in the castle up in the hill would have his tenant farmers. Same, same sort of ratios in the UK. <clears throat> A lot of land in the UK is not owned by the farmer, it's leased. Now we might say, okay, <clears throat> they've got different environments. Yes, they do in some areas, but they also, in the US there's certainly droughts. They've been through a pretty horrid one in the last 10 years. Uh, we have droughts here. So then you start saying, okay, if we're going to be looking at this and all the volatility that we have, prices and droughts and so forth, can we do some risk sharing? So we'll talk about that a little bit shortly. Land as a business investment in its own class. Now I was looking at a family situation down in New South Wales and there was a succession plan going on and one of the brothers of the parent uh, age group had been a silent partner in a block of land, <coughs> farming country. And in this process of deciding what was going to happen, which pieces of land, there was a number of blocks involved, but which pieces were going to be sold, which pieces are going to be retained within the, the, um, the next generational succession process, how this break-off could happen with this silent partner brother. So, the, the, In fact, there was a, a parents, a son, but there was an uncle who was the silent partner. You with me? Been in that situation for 25 years. <clears throat> When they, we went back and did the analysis of land values 25 years ago, land values during the period when it was sold, the yield, in other words the cash flow out of it, what would have been able to have been paid in a dividend in a co company situation, and the capital gain actually beat the 200 index, the ASX 200 index. Now down in that farming country, there's a lot of uh, Canadian teachers funds, there's, there's all these overseas corporates that have much longer time frame uh, interests in, in holding land. Some of them <coughs> put their own managers on, many of them just lease them back to the farmers and they'll carry on under a lease agreement. The significant amounts of that pastoral, of uh, farming country down that way is now handed that way. <clears throat> so, they have a, long a longer time frame aspect. They're, they're not looking for these, you know, the fellows in the ASX, these um, public companies are looking for quarterly returns. What happened in the last quarter is the profit up, profit down. Agriculture doesn't work that, like that, okay? But the Asians have a long term view, North Americans have a long term view, Germans have a long term view, the English have a long term view. Essentially, we're a very small player in the world agricultural market and uh, the scope for other, other players in this space to take a, a view of, 
of uh, land as an enterprise on its own. Land leasing has one or two or a couple of different components to it. If you have a, a house in town <coughs> and you um, rent the house out and it's under a say, two year, one year lease or something like that, and during that period you sell the house, then the next buyer is obliged to take that lease over and the tenant will stay. Okay? That's the similar process with a standard lease agreement. In, uh, in, in agricultural land too, okay? And <coughs> whoever is the tenant, let's call them the tenant because it's, an, it's, a, it's a term that rings in your head that you've got an understanding of who I'm talking about. Uh, they have a right to quiet enjoyment. <coughs> it's one of the easiest parts of law, not that I'm a lawyer, <laughs> to actually understand. <laughs> they use a lot of other quirky words but that one's actually relatively easy to understand. Okay, so you just go and barge in the door and say, oh, I need to see my place. Um, this is prior time when you go back and you check your house, what holes are in the wall, what doors have fallen off, you know, what's happened to the roof and so forth. And under a basic lease agreement, that's very similar to leasing agricultural land. So security of access is an issue with land leasing. Though all those components, you can actually adjust. If you've got them in your plan that you want to go and inspect your place every quarter or half year or year or whatever it is, you just get it included. Okay, so you can adjust all that stuff. So you're in, so this is part of the business about writing your own rules of the game. But it is, Recognise it for what it is in a lease agreement. It's different to some other agreements that you might have, like adjustment or something like that. <coughs> there are legal components in, in that lease agreement that, that you need to look at. Usually you've got a, a timed payment process. And you'd look at it and you'd say, OK, well, I just want an, one annual payment in advance. So uh, if you're starting off a lease, and it starts on the 30th of April this year, you'd get your first payment, 30th of April this year. If it was six monthly, most of the payments were in advance, then you'd, um, you'd get payments every six months. Okay, so there's, there's uh, calculations on how much interest is, is accrued in those values and so forth, but you'd set a time for, say, three years at a, <coughs> uh, an agreed figure for payments to take place every six months. So, but be mindful of when the turn off and cash flow of your tenant might be. So if he's got a, a turn off of cattle that are going off in, uh, let's say, August, September, October, and that's when his cash flow is, then negotiate with him and say, OK, we'll try, you know, we'll try and make this um, acceptable for when you're going to have cash in your pocket, let's make the payments or most of the payments during that period. Like Anthony was saying, you've actually got to try and work together to make this easy for both parties. At the end of the day, you'll end up with the same cash, but just be mindful of when they're going to have the most of the cash in the pocket. Okay. Um, Look, the standard thing is, we, we did talk about the length of, to of leases and so forth this morning, but uh, a standard is a sort of a three by two. In other words, you're going for three years at one rate. And then there would be adjustment and <coughs> an option to continue for an extended two year period or something like that. But you can make it whatever you like. You can make it three by three, you can make it five by five if you want to. But be mindful that after a period of time, things change. Property values can change. If you've got a concept of what property values are, are in your value in your own head, and values change over that time, then you need a period when three years' time you're going to adjust that because property values have changed. The cash flow side is what's happened in the cattle prices or sheep prices in that time, or wool prices, what's happening in that time frame where you would adjust or allow uh, uh, a time when you're going to actually make a decision about whether you're going to increase 
the rent and continue on at a different level and then at the end of that two-year option you might start again and say well we're starting a new lease this time we're going to go five by five we want a 10-year program and it's part of your succession plan change of ownership kids are off the farm but they want a um, a passive investment still want to own the land you've moved to town things have changed completely okay one of the partners might have died but the tenant has security that he knows that he's going to have access to that land for that, that time. Because even though you might have a dry time and the carrying capacity of the property might fall away, their business enterprise might say, you know, they've got triggers to say, okay, well, we're going to crash our, <coughs> our numbers down, but we want to retain access to land because what's the dearest thing that goes up when things get dry? adjustment. So they get security of knowing that they're going to have access to that land for the period of time and that's what that's the flip side of this tenure process <clears throat> and many many of these guys that use adjustment in an extensive way are looking for security of their tenure. They want to know that if they've got four or five places leased they want to know that <laughs> in three years time they're still going to have four or five places leased. They don't want to get down in 18 months time and they're on some adjustment program and they're kicked off and you know, they've got to chase, go chasing feed somewhere else or adjustment. That really complicates it for them. They can do their budgets on the basis of knowing what their cash flow is and their access to land. It just makes it so much simpler for them. Risk sharing. Okay, you need to establish what LSUs, and we talked about this earlier, what number of LSUs you can handle in your place. And if you build an index of saying, okay, if my rainfall falls by 20%, my carrying capacity from your records, from your knowledge of your past, you'll have an idea of what you need to drop your LSUs back to. Okay, so you have an LSU per hundred millimetres of per hectares per hundred millimetres of rainfall process in there. And there are people around who can, who can put that together for you. Uh, but you put that in the lease agreement. So we talked this morning about cows calving and getting your LSUs too high and needing to pull numbers down. But you can adjust rainfall in there as well. So it's all about this risk sharing process. <clears throat> and it, it comes down to you being comfortable to a point where both parties understand that you have a, a requirement to cut LSUs on the place. But alongside that, if you've got a good tenant, you want to keep him. So offer him a discount. Not a discount, a rebate, sorry. Offer him a rebate. Now, the vernacular of a rebate and a discount to me, as a marketer, it's a bit different because it's something that you're offering. And you offer them a reduction in the payment, whatever that might be. But you've got to recognise that if he walks, you've got no payments at all. You're not going to have any cash flow coming in. You can take him to court. You can do all the legal stuff. But it's not going to solve your problem. You'll end up with a heap of legal fees. <laughs> and if he's gone bust or he's hidden his money, if you've got a, you know, some sort of guarantee, then you're not going to go anywhere. So try and be positive about how you look at the reduction in, in a lease agreement and a rebate process. So it's based on rainfall. Rainfall, whatever your average rainfall might be or your mean, <coughs> when your, your 100 millimetres for 12 months rainfall starts to fall away or some other index that you might have, put that in the plan, okay? Good, a good tenant is worth money to you. Whether you've got a house, particularly with a house, but also with, with agricultural land. So, um, base price, price of volatility rebate. Word rebate's not on there, but write it on your sheet. Or, sorry, the rebate is there, yeah. Um, guarantee. Renting a house, tenants pay a bond. Uh, 
I've never actually asked for a bond, but you can. It could be one three month payment, for instance, sits in the account. Uh, okay. Um, then you can ask for bank, director's guarantee, personal guarantees if you want to go to that point. Um, okay, so you can, you can ask for that in the, in the setup arrangement. What else have we got? Break clause. Shit happens. Fires. Oh, mate, go sh fishing one day. <laughs> he doesn't come back. Death. <laughs> 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 Took up a job in the seafood industry. <laughs> I've had that happen. And a uh, guy, business partner, died. He was in trouble. What do I do about it? Do I hold him to the agreement? <clears throat> do I have a mechanism there for you to release him where the obligation on is, is possibly on, not an obligation, but the right of you to say, look, if such and such happens, um, I will release you out of it. Okay? Now, go and talk to your solicitor and all that sort of thing, get some other advice on those particular issues. But there are ways of systemising, allowing people to, to come out without you actually possibly you losing that much. So if you were to say, okay, the release agreement, and this is just a suggestion, if the release, uh, if you agree that there's a break clause and whatever reason the guy needs to move, okay, here's the declaration or the, the, the conditions. You will, after the last beast leaves the property, destocked, he has to pay one payment, if it's a quarterly payment for instance, he pays one payment beyond that as a fee for the right to break the lease, or not the right, but the, the fee to allow the lease to be broken. And then you have a time frame of saying, okay, well, I've still got cash flow. I've now got six months to make another arrangement. Now at the moment, it's a, it's a seller's market. There are a lot of people looking for lease country. I, I would get 40 to one ratio of phone calls. People looking to lease country. To one saying, oh, I've got a place to lease. So at the moment, that's, that's the reading that I'm getting out of, out of the calls. I'm not directly involved with this business all the time these days, but that would be the ratio of, of, in, of interest I get. Okay, so your um, You've written the rules about how you, how you would break the how you uh, would um, um, how you would break what sort of break clause you're going to have in there of something along those lines. So you're then allowing six months to reorganise yourself. You, you've got a lot. First of all, you've got a huge amount of new knowledge in your head because you've had this experience. Are there things you need to adjust in the next agreement that you're going to write up? How are you going to advertise differently? How are you going to assess approaches differently? That's, that's all stuff you put in your database. Store all that stuff away, because that's experience. Alerts. Um, things happen when you lease a place out. And uh, I had a, uh, actually a friend who I was helping actually, um, her husband was killed. And she leased a place out and she went and sold all the cattle straight away. Well, <coughs> that became a tax issue <laughs> that could have been handled differently. Okay, so you need to talk to your accountant about this stuff. Your primary producer sta status may or generally will be under threat. Okay, you lose your primary producer status, but get clarification from experts on that. This is the, the disclaimer, okay? <laughs> Uh, what are you going to do with your own concluding livestock sales? That's fine. I mean, uh, my approach to that would be, okay, well, I'll go and actually do some adjustment somewhere else. Spread those sales out over two years. Get a tax consideration on what's going on with that asset sale. 
get some accounting advice on what sort of structures you need, what sort of sale processes you need in terms of time frame over periods of time about how that should be dealt with. Now, business structure, similar, well, get advice again. If you've got trusts and all those um, probably slightly more complicated situations of companies and all these other things that, that uh, we sort of tend to get ourselves involved with, get clarity on that. Get clear on this stuff. Get advice so you understand it in your own head. If your accountant starts explaining to you and you don't understand, don't nod your head, said, you're going to have to explain this to me another way, mate. I've got to get clarity on this so I know exactly where I stand. Understand your own time frames for this. So you're in complete control of all this knowledge all the time. Get it down to way, 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 way from rocket science stuff. Keep it simple. Okay. Separate your lifestyle <clears throat> with leasing. Um, you might have some other considerations about, uh, you know, the tenant says, look, are you going to live in the house? Yes, we'd like to stay in our own, in our own nest, our own station, in our own homestead. Uh, there's a couple of paddocks out the back we want to run a few horses in. Um, that all becomes part of the agreement. I'm prepared to say um, day three, three days a week, go and check the water, four days a week, whatever it might be. Once you start those discussions about what you're going to be doing on your own farm for the tenant, keep that out of the lease agreement. Don't write it into the lease agreement. Because if something happens to you and you're unable to fulfil your obligation, then that brings the whole lease agreement under some tension. If you've got a lease agreement on its own, <clears throat> in other words, you're offering the property and all its, all its specifications that you're putting with it, uh, then that's a package on its own. Look at how you would separate your own services, another different product altogether. If you choose to, put it in, but look at keeping it out. Just do another sheet up of paper saying, look, um, I don't need to go through the solicitor just to have an agreement. If you want to write it down or do it with a handshake if that's how you feel comfortable. So there's an understanding that the lease agreement stands. If you fall off the perch for whatever reason or you choose to pull out of your homestead and move to town, <clears throat> you're not obliged to go and employ someone else to do the stuff that you were doing. You follow? Does that make sense? Just one other business about uh, uh, rate payments and insurance and that sort of thing. Um, one thing, about New South Wales, <coughs> if you don't pay your rates, then, then uh, the council can resume. You probably won't start putting Leons on it and so forth, or put it up for auction. Uh, those sort of things, generally, you're better off doing yourself. So in your lease agreement, say, I will pay the, um, the rates. So at least you've separated him out of that obligation. You might build it into the price that ultimately you're going to do the deal at, but keep the rates in your own control. So if he doesn't pay the rates, you've got a complication. Do you follow what I mean? A bit like that with insurance. If I lease a place, I look for, um, uh, crikey, what's the term? It's actually a, just a document from his insurance company saying that he has the public risk policy covered for that period. I can't remember the name of the term, but it, it's a certificate, certificate of currency, that's it, yeah. Okay. Every 12 months, ask him to fax you a copy of his certificate of currency. So you've got a copy in your hand and you know that that part of the insurance is current. <coughs> okay, prospects. Neighbours. I've had a couple of discussions around neighbours and so forth. So what are they looking to do? Build scale or a joint venture? The, the uh, Billa Bulla program was a joint venture, building a bigger business. Family members, succession, 
sons, daughters, cousins or whoever it might be, okay? What's the next one? Start up individuals, new entrants, young people. Here's an example, we've got a terrific example here of Anthony, new company, a new couple trying to get into the industry. Non-landowning producers, they're usually product focused. In other words, their capital's going into capital, into uh, cattle or livestock or whatever it is. That's where they want, the, they've chosen in their business to have their money invested in livestock. They're not interested in the land. I've had fellows down, uh, uh, a couple, well, a number of guys actually, who own uh, 300 acres to live on, run a few horses on, everything else is leased. That's how they build scale. Run four or five thousand cows on maybe two or three, one, two, three or four places or whatever. Uh, they're interested in spreading their risk. So if they've got four or five places, they might spread them out in different areas. So you're getting some, they're spreading their production, um, seasonal risk, rainfall risk. It was one of the interests in me coming up to Bolland, even though Bollands can get pretty tight at times, I could see a time frame that I felt comfortable about, about placing cattle in that area. John, just on the example of the 300 acre homestead base and that a significantly large enterprise yep. external to that, have you got any insight into how they were actually funding their growth? Oh, funding their growth. Um, <laughs> Well, the one in particular was actually uh, the one I had direct involvement with. He was a Wagyu man. So he was actually leveraging a lot of his supply. He had his own cattle, but he had these other hundred people behind him who was building his scale. <laughs> okay, so he's in actually a supply chain. You never know where these people are going to pop up from. You'd never be I am surprised, serendipitous as I am, <laughs> about what people come up with and offer me at times. So just be aware that those people are around. They could be a live export uh, processor or, or a tr um, licensed live, live exporter and they're looking to aggregate cattle somewhere. It could be part of a quarantine program. Uh, there's a whole raft of people out there doing different things particularly with volumes. If you can stitch yourself into that program, good luck to you, good on you. Um, corporate farmers, similar sort of story. Supply chains, aggregation, quarantine, foreigners, investors. Again, looking to build, build scale. <coughs> um, and some of them are also involved with le livestock leasing. Okay. Take control, righto. This is really the take home messages. Write your own rules. All of this process that we've all been talking about is actually writing your own rules of the game. That's all. <clears throat> when you get good at it, go and design a board game and write your own rules for that too. You might be able to sell that, okay? Same story. Then if you've written your own rules and you know where you're going, you know what your own visions are about where you want to be, the lifestyle you want to have, what sort of income security you might be looking for, you've built your own ideas about what your value is, then you're in a position to respond to other people's rules. So you might have a, one of the big pastoral companies front up to your door and say, I hear you've got your place available. Um, now here are our terms. Because they write their own rules. So don't be surprised when other people turn up with their own rules. Just be ready to respond to them. Because then you're in a position where you can negotiate and say, oh, yeah, well this looks fine, but this is what we want. Well, that looks okay. And I like that, and I like that, and I like that, but no, we're not happy with this. Because we've already made a decision about those particular aspects. You get where I'm coming from? Price. 
We talked this morning about value being an opinion, price being a fact. When you get to price, all of these other issues should have been gone through, okay? You've, you're setting up a, a value proposition in your own head about what you think you want, and what you think it's worth, <clears throat> but you don't have a price until you both agree. So understand the bid and the offer, one side and the other, before you actually agree. I mean, all these rebate processes that you might be risk sharing proposition. Some people haven't even heard of risk sharing. What are you talking about? Oh yeah, we're going to offer you a rebate of such and such. How do you feel about this, that and the other? Yeah? Hello? Wow. Okay. Make the deal, then get to know them. No, -uh. no thanks. Spend time on it. Get your, get your partner involved with listening. You go to a bank meeting, for instance, and you've got your partner with you, and you can walk out of a meeting and you can have a discussion, and invariably, each of you have heard a different story. If you've got three people there, your son or your daughter or your daughter-in-law, take as many as you can. There's no limit on how many people you can have around the table on your side. But when they're gone, well, what do you think of that? I heard this, that and the other. Yeah, but he said, what do you think? I don't like, you know, just chuck it up in the air, let it all fall down. You have to create your own impression eventually. Have fun. Life's a bugger when your feet hit the floor every morning and... Uh, you gotta make you gotta make fun out of this. And if you don't think you are, think how the hell am I gonna get we need to get off this place for a while. I don't need to go and have a drink with a few blokes at the pub or just put it on your list to do. Don't jump in the surf or have a swim in the creek or don't get eaten by a crocodile, that's all, but just make it a priority to have fun. Have a barbecue, get your, just spontaneously. No notice, hey, come over for a barbecue. Right? We just decided that we've got a couple of steaks here, yeah. Bring a rogger if you want. Just break the ice. <coughs> just get yourself back to ground zero. We hear a lot about mental health. Big, big issue. And I bet you no one in this room has not had some issue that's got you somewhere down the scale of where you need not to be. So it's a process of how you get yourself back up the scale and others around you. Toughest thing about mental health is not the person that's sick. It's the person that's actually trying to look after them. They're there too. Have fun, have fun. That top YouTube one, you've seen, okay? Bottom one underneath, it's just a good story. But uh, yeah, plug it in, have a look at it. There's a number of other of those Billabura ones there that are, that are uh, worth, in, worth looking at. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, there's my contact details. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>